This segment will discuss the difference between assisted suicide and withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment. If you think about it, withdrawing a ventilator in the case of a patient who is hopelessly ill seems like assisted suicide in some ways. You're taking an act that leads to the death of a person. And in fact, that's what suicide advocates claim. There's no moral difference between giving a person a drug that will kill them and withdrawing some type of life-sustaining treatment that will lead to their death. That is, they say that there's no moral difference between killing and allowing to die. Here's an analogy that was given in the medical literature that kind of illustrates. Here's an example of killing. Smith stands to gain a large inheritance if anything should happen to his six-year-old cousin. One evening, while the child is taking a bath, Smith sneaks into the bathroom and drowns the child. Then he arranges so that it will look like an accident. Obviously wrong. Now here's a similar case of allowing to die. Jones also stands to gain if anything should happen to a six-year-old cousin. Like Smith, Jones sneaks in, planning to drown the child in his bath. However, just as he enters the bathroom, he sees the child slip and hit his head and fall face down in the water. Jones is delighted. He stands by, ready to push the child's head back under if it's necessary, but it's not necessary. With only a, a little thrashing about, the child drowns all by himself, quote, accidentally, as Jones watches and does nothing. So this is a case of allowing to die, which is clearly morally equivalent to as if he had done the action. So the author's point is, what's the difference? There's a moral equivalence. Well, I would argue that there are three, at least three differences um, that, uh, between withdrawing life-sustaining treatment and suicide. The first is a difference in intent. The second is a difference in moral justification. And the third is a difference in the moral duty type involved. And we'll start, we'll go from easiest to most complex. So we'll start with intention. Suicide intends death as a means to alleviate suffering. Now, advocates will say they don't intend the death. They don't want the death. Uh, but but that's true as an end. They don't. They wish there was some other way. They don't want the death as the the goal, the ultimate goal. But they do intend the death as the means to alleviate suffering because they view that there is no other way to do so. In withdrawing, you don't intend death at all. At least in a legitimate example of withdrawing of care. What you intend to do is to remove the harm caused by the ventilator or other life-sustaining treatment. You have a treatment that's burdensome to the person. The ventilator is causing uh, discomfort in the throat. Uh, the person has to be sedated in order to uh, have it. And in some cases, the ventilator itself can actually harm the lungs and the body. So this treatment is causing harm. And in cases where it's of questionable benef questionable benefit, you remove it. And, you, and the reason you do is to try to remove the harm that you're actively causing to the person. You do not intend the death in either as an end or as a means. So that's a difference. This also comes out in whether, whether you look at death as a failure or a success. So in suicide, it's a failure if the patient lives. And in rare cases, of physician-assisted suicide, uh, probably about 1% uh, of people, they live through the lethal medication, and that would be a failure. They intended to kill themselves, and they failed to do so. The drug didn't work. In withdrawing, it's a success even if the patient lives. Your goal is to remove the harm caused by the treatment, and so if the patient lives, they're still not being harmed by the treatment. You've successfully done what you've tried to do. In suicide, uh, you're arguably violating the first do no harm principle because you're harming the person, you're killing them. That's a harm that, that's unintent that people don't really want to do, but they feel they have to do it in order to achieve the goal. 
um, so that you're first doing harm in order to get to your goal, whereas with withdrawing, you're fulfilling the first do no harm principle. Because again, your intention is to remove the harm caused by the treatment. So you're first doing no harm. So for these, at least these three reasons, there's a difference in intention in between assist, assisted suicide and withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. There's also a difference in the principle used to justify the act. So suicide advocates uh, will, in my opinion, incorrectly justify the act. They justify it by saying the end justifies the means. Now, they, they would not all say it this way necessarily. They may say that, uh, that compassion is taking priority over the duty to sustain life. But really what that's saying is the good end of alleviating suffering justifies the bad means of killing a person. Normally killing a person is bad. In and of itself, killing a person is bad. But uh, they're willing to accept that badness in, on account of some greater good that they see. So that greater good is the end which justifies the means. So even if you use a conflict of duties type justification, ultimately it's still uh, justifying the end by the means. Now with withdrawing of care, uh, that is justified by the, the principle of double effect, not th the end justifies the means. And th this is getting heady, so let me give you a picture that illustrates. So in, if, when you withdraw a ventilator, there are two consequences, potentially. There, you, you, the, you potentially may die. And potentially, uh, or definitely, you will receive no more harm from the treatment, which is no longer being done to you. So that's a double effect. Uh, and both effects follow immediately from the action. If you die, um, it's not because you're not getting harm from the treatment. It comes directly from having withdrawn the life-sustaining treatment. So contrast that with assisted suicide. There you give a lethal medication, which causes death, which then leads to the effect of no, having no more harm from the disease, no more burden or disability from the disease. In this case, there's no way to get to the goal of having no more burden of disease except through death. There's no, uh, the, the treatment works by killing you. Uh, that's the only way to get to the end. Here, the, end, the, the good end follows immediately from the action. So here, there's essentially two effects. One's bad and one's good, and the, the good one um, could justify the bad one because you don't have because the bad one is not the means to the end. Whereas in assisted suicide, it's different, and you can see from the diagrams how the causal structure of what you're doing, the reality of what you're doing, is different in its causal chain. That's a that's a major moral difference. One uses the end to justify the means, and the other does not. There are other um, qualifications that apply to the principle of double effect, um, but I will not be going over those now. I do encourage people to look them up uh, because it is important to determine whether the double effect principle can be used in any particular case. There's also, this is the third difference between assisted suicide and withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment. There's a difference in the type of duty we're talking about. And this is probably the hardest to understand, but we'll uh, try. So in suicide, you're, you're, that pertains or violates a negative duty. We have a do not kill. Do not kill is a negative thing. Don't do it. Withdrawing life-sustaining treatment, on the other hand, pertains to an affirmative duty, meaning something that you have to do. So there's a duty to sustain life by proportionate means. If you don't eat or you neglect your health just because you're too lazy to go to the doctor or something like that, that's negligence because we have a duty to sustain our life. Um, 
So that's something that we have to do. You have to eat, for example. Now, there's a difference, there's a moral difference between these kinds of duties. So affirmative duties are things that have to be done. So you have to do it at a certain time. You know, you have to eat at some time. You don't have to eat at every time, but you can't go too long without eating. You have to do it at some point. Um, now, affirmative duties uh, cannot, since, since we're limited people, uh, limited beings, we can't do more than one thing at a time, essentially. You can't eat and sleep at the same time. You can't, you often can't eat and work to support your children at the same time. So you have to judge when are you going to do each duty. Um, and and that is that means that uh, there's some ordering in terms of what's most important. And it also means that in cases of hardship, uh, like uh, it's very a uh, very difficult thing to do, or uh, it's going to be futile for some reason, uh, th that can remove the duty. Um, whereas with negative duties, there's no effort required to do it. It doesn't it doesn't take any effort on my part to not kill people. I just have to refrain from doing it. And and you can you can not do more than one thing at a time. So I can not kill, not lie, not cheat, not commit adultery all at the same time. So for that reason, negative duties are not subject to exceptions in the same way that affirmative duties are. And this is a major moral difference between the duty to sustain life with life-sustaining treatment and the duty not to kill oneself uh, with physician-assisted suicide. There's, now that was kind of heady, but a, an example may help illustrate uh, the difference between these types of duties. Go back to the, the example in the literature of drowning a child. We have a duty not to drown children. I think that's pretty uh, well agreed, and there are no exceptions to that. Uh, it's not hard for me to avoid drowning children. And um, it's not futile. Uh, I can easily avoid drowning children. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what about saving a drowning child? Now, in the example given before, where the child is just in a bathtub and it would be very easy to pick him up out of the bathtub, you would have a duty to do that. You would have a duty out of charity to your neighbor, uh, out of love of your neighbor, you would be uh, required to do that. But sometimes there could be exceptions. So what if the child is drowning in a lake and you can't swim? So what that means is that you would be unlikely to succeed at saving him. Um, so so the, the act of saving him would be futile, and therefore uh, you, would not, you would be accepted from the duty to drown the child because you're incapable of doing it. Or suppose that the child was drowning in a very turbulent river and you could only save him at the cost of your own life. So there, there's a, a grave and serious burden and cost for you to save the child, and there's also a proportionate reason, your life versus his life, uh, they kind of uh, are of equal value. And so in that case, uh, you would be accepted from the duty to save the child. Um, now, obviously, if you uh, were late for a business deal that you might make $100, some small, measly amount, that would not be a good reason. That would not be a proportionate reason to, say, to, to avoid saving the child, and there the duty would remain. So, but the point is that in some cases of affirmative duties, there are exceptions for futility and hardship, um, which is exactly the case with, um, with drawing life-sustaining treatment. So in summary on the duty type thing, assisted suicide is never justified because it violates a negative duty, whereas withdrawing is sometimes, but not always, justified because it deals with an affirmative duty which can be abrogated or accepted by a disproportionate hardship. I hope I've made that clear, but in any case, there are at least three different reasons uh, why assisted suicide is different than withdrawing life-sustaining treatment. The first is that there's a difference in the intention. One intends death at least as a means. The second is that there's a difference in justifying principle. 
And the third is that there's a difference in the type of duty um, to which the action pertains.